From County College of Morris, this is CCM All Access. Hello, and welcome to CCM All Access, the show that brings you news and information from the County College of Morris. Students on campus, members of the community, people doing good things. I'm Mitchell Etta, and joining us today is Professor Joshua Fry, who teaches in the math department here at CCM. Welcome, Joshua. Thank you for having me. So what was your background education, and what made you want to come to CCM? Uh, I mean, education, I went undergrad at Illinois State University, grad school at George Washington University in DC. Um, it was all math, I was a pure math major, uh, got a master's in, in math at George Washington. Um, as a grad student was doing some like uh, teaching, you know, TA and, um, but I was doing a lot of tutoring and I did a, a good amount of that for years after getting my master's. I was trying to get into teaching but was just doing sort of tutoring and, and more part-time stuff. Um, eventually got into adjuncting around, um, around here is, is when I started teaching at the college level was um, at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, right, right over the border. Um, Northampton Community College, another one right there. Uh, Union, I started moving closer, but CCM just ended up applying to a bunch of places in the area. CCM had a, a full-time tenure track open up. I applied to it and, and came here. I've really liked it since getting here. I, you know, applying to that sort of thing, I didn't know a whole lot about the school. You know, mm -hmm. I was just trying to get a job, sort of. Um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely liked it here. It's, it's got a real good reputation. I can kind of see why the, the you, you, I think the, the biggest indicator is the other faculty, like the people that I work with. It's like mm -hmm. they obviously know what they're doing and they're on their, they're on their game. And yeah. everyone's uh, very uh, good, but also very personable and, and approachable and helpful too. So it's been a very enjoyable experience working here, absolutely. Would you say that you learn a lot from the, the people who have been working here for longer than you? Like, do, do you learn and take notes from them? Yeah, you, you pick up teaching stuff. You just talk about teaching the things that, that other teachers do in their classes. And, you know, I'll take ideas or share ideas, like stuff that works. Um, we, we have our, our Center for Teaching and Learning, our CTL, where we can go and, and get extra professional development, like in-house, mm -hmm. like learn about things people are doing here, exactly, like even looking outside your uh, discipline, right? maybe going outside of math just to get other ideas. And I like doing this. And I even participate in this. I, I, uh, worked with a couple other professors teaching how to maybe design hybrid courses, you know, when they're like half online and half in person, like considerations for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I've, I've picked up stuff. I tried to share what I've, I've picked up, but yeah, you, you learn a lot from other teachers, absolutely. So what made you chose to teach for your career? I think that was maybe uh, the uh, natural, but I don't know, like just math was what I was very good at. Like, from high school, like I was doing well, and I was taking all the math courses there, and that's how I decided my major. I'm like, well, I'm doing really good at math. I guess I got to pick a major. I'm going to pick math. So I just started doing math in college, which was good because high school math, even through like calculus, it's mm -hmm. it's very algorithmic. Even like all of high school math, it's kind of just built into calculus. Uh, you start getting into the higher level stuff, the linear algebra, the discretes. That's when the door starts opening of what like math really is. And when I saw that, where you're like writing proofs and you're, you're trying to form your arguments and then you're really getting into some deep theory about the stuff. That was, was very interesting to me. So I ran with that. I just started taking all the math courses I could as an undergrad. I started taking math grad courses as an undergrad because I took all their undergrad courses. Uh, I think I mentioned before that um, I also minored in philosophy. That was kind of just to take some other classes. Mm -hmm. But that'll help. To, and and it, it was just very interesting to me. And so uh, also throughout this whole time, your question of why, why am I teaching, as I found myself helping peers, helping other students just all the time in, in college and in high school. You form study groups, you go. But I, I sort of understood this stuff. But I always went because, and I'll tell people this, even if you understand whatever subject, go in and, and studying with people and even explaining, helping others like understand it, what you understand, is going to reinforce your understanding. You're going to understand it even better once yeah. you have to explain it to somebody. So yeah. if you really just, you're trying to get the best, or you want the A, even if you think you understand it, go to a study group and help everybody. Like, mm -hmm. explain it to them. Once you have to explain it, you, you have to understand it at a different level to explain mm -hmm. it to somebody else rather than just do it. And you said that you were really good in math throughout high school. Uh, would you say that you also enjoyed doing it? And at that point, you knew that you wanted to do it as a profession? 
No, again, I, I would say that happened more in college. I, okay. I did it because, because it, it's, I'll say maybe it's not as interesting. It, calculus is a very useful tool, but in terms of creative thinking, there's not too much of it there. It's, it's more straightforward of, of what you have to do. There's some of it in Calc 2. Uh, in Calc 2, you got to be a little more creative because that's more difficult stuff. That's when you start getting into that, that door I'm talking about of, okay. of like the higher level math thinking that you got to get into. That's what I want to try and show people. I think that's what I came out, out of college with. Of, yeah, I, I can understand this stuff, but I'm also pretty good at explaining it. And I like trying to get people, I, I, I am annoyed of the people that say, I'm not good at math, or I just need to get through this math course. It's like, you can give it a little bit more of a chance. I, I think you're, you're, you're scared of it because it seems different than many other. It is a good amount different than a lot of other disciplines, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot purer than a lot of other disciplines. And so I, I try to get people a little more interested in it. I, I think maybe that's the, the gut feeling that, that made me go into teaching. So before we started recording, you and I were talking about uh, how some people may be born with like this logistic skill. They might be better in math to begin with. Can you explain that a little bit? I, I think they'll just pick up on the logic a little bit faster. That's, that's the processing of it, I think, is the difference, um, how fast someone can process through mm -hmm. it. I, I think you can, at least on some level with anybody, sit with them and ask them the right questions or try to step them through something that they can take the basic steps in logic and that that's all math is, is that there are logical arguments. You are, you are trying to work through something, sometimes step by step, but that you're forming a, a, a keep saying the word logical, a purely logical argument that no one's going to be able to argue with you about. Mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of the whole point of math, is you need a, an airtight proof of something that there's no exceptions, there's no cases you haven't considered that might disprove it, uh, that, that it's, it's definitely true and, and no one can say otherwise. <coughs> So then that leads me into saying, what interests you about CCM and teaching here? I know that you said that you've taught here for, this is, I think, your fourth year, yeah, you were I'm saying? Yeah, I'm in the middle of my fourth year here, yeah. So what interests you about CCM, that it being your fourth year here? I like the, the community college kind of setting. It's, I, I like the idea of, of the community college. It's cheaper alternative. You, you can do all these sort of gen ed stuff. I, I did these gen ed things at ISU, but there's no reason to do them in a four year, especially if it's not your degree program, it's not something you're focusing on. You just you're taking them for the program. You, you can if you can get them done here, and and like I said, we got great faculty here. You're going to learn the stuff just as well, if not better, than, than mm -hmm. other four year colleges. That getting people on the on the right foot and trying to connect at this kind of level to say, from my ass, you know, teaching math. Like, yeah, math is fine. Math can be fun. Like, there's there's good stuff here too. Um, run with that if if you want, and and, and try to show them a little bit of that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I like the the community college vibe in general. Like I said, mm -hmm. I, I adjuncted at Lafayette College. That's a four year versus Northampton. There's maybe different kinds of students at each, but you get different people no matter where you go. There's always all different kinds of people, all different kinds of students. So I, I, I like the idea of community college, and, and I like uh, the people that I work with here, and that's always a big one wherever you're working. You gotta like the people that mm -hmm. you're working with. Would that's you say those? Most of it. Would you say those are the key differences between teaching at community college uh, rather? Uh, versus a four-year college, just the people, or are there other things within the I mean, the there, was, there was good people at some of the other places, too. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, from, from the job aspect, you know, my, my view, teaching at four years is different than teaching at two years, because at a four-year, you're, you're a full research professor. Like, okay. you're, you focus, like, that's a big part of your job, is, is your research, publishing stuff, you know, you know, coming up with things. We don't do any of that here, but as a four year, that means you teach less because you have this big research aspect. Okay. That's, that's not nearly as emphasized here. You know, the teaching is, we we'll even call community colleges, teaching colleges is, is more of our focus. So we take on higher teaching, we teach more classes, um, okay. but our research or our focus, our development in, is how to become the best teacher versus researching something in math, you know, some problem in math that we're, we're trying to solve or something like that. Like okay. a four year institution, you're doing that in addition to teaching. Here, it's all focus on teaching and even doing, if you're doing some kind of research, you're researching teaching and, and best teaching practices and stuff okay. like this, or how to improve your school uh, in general, improve outcomes at your school, um, would be like the main job difference between working at a four year to two year. Okay. Um, so I guess the emphasis on teaching, I, I've done math research uh, as an undergrad. I worked with some professors on, on summer research things in grad school, uh, took some independent research, you know, research courses and, and did math research and looked at you know what at what that sort of thing is or what that kind of job would be like. And I don't think that was for me. Like mm -hmm. um, I can understand this stuff enough, but 
I, it wasn't as interesting to me to, to get into like the real high level difficult math problems that you got to do this, spend a lot of work and research yeah. and, and maybe not even solve or really get any uh, tangible results from. So for you, um, the teaching aspect was a lot more exciting than the research. Yeah, aspect. and maybe uh, talking about these natural abilities is just a little bit better at it that, that I could explain to people or, or keep people's interest enough because that's another big thing about teaching. It doesn't matter what your discipline is, you are on stage. You are trying yep. to keep people's attention. You are acting in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. So so I got to bring some energy because I'll get that sort of comment. Like at least you move around. Like uh, I get the teachers that stand behind the podium, stand behind the computer, and just sort of go through the lecture slides. They can kind of fall asleep, and even with all my energy, I still have students falling asleep. So <laughs> it, it, you kind of you got to you know, do what you can and take what you can, you know, from from what you do as well. I think. Now this might be an obvious answer, but do you think there is a correlation between how a math professor or teacher teaches and the students' grades in the class? I mean, it's got to be right. Yeah, like sure. Um, if I start asking like what I think works better than something, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, if you're not if you're not engaging them, if you're not getting them to do stuff, that's going to be a problem because because you learn math by doing it. I, I can yep. sit there and talk to you all day long, and a comment I'll get very often is, "Oh, I'm in class watching you do it. You make it all seem so easy." And then when I go back and try to do it myself, it's, it's a different story. So trying to get a little bit of that in class, like. Actually, try to do this. Like, work through this right now. Don't just sit here and listen to me. You're not gonna. You're not gonna pick it up that way. Mm -hmm. I'm here to s jump you off. You. You need to put in the work. You need to do the practice. That's where the real learning happens. And that's what uh, something else we were talking about beforehand. Or no, in, in this that go do it with a group of people. Even if you really understand it, go explain it to other people. Really get it solid. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about math, especially like algebra pre-calc, if you're going through the calculus, it all builds off one another. Like you don't remember your algebra, you're going to run into a dead end at calculus that you can't solve a certain calculus problem because it uses algebra, it uses pre-calc, mm -hmm. it uses all different kinds of things and culminates in calculus. But you, if you don't have all that other stuff solid, the, the calculus is, is a, a big headache. So the next question I have for you is what makes you feel that you're a strong fit for our faculty? I, the students like me. I, I think if nothing, if you're getting the students engaged and uh, getting them to want to come take your course, then then I think if I can get them involved and get them excited or get them taking the math class, wanting to take the math class, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a big plus in my column for why why I think I'm good here. Um, hearing the overhearing conversations around or hear people that oh yeah, go take fry. Like if the options I got to take this pre-calc, they're saying go take fry. I'm like, yeah, I think if I'm getting that kind of reputation, I'll, I'll take that. Um, but and, and I think some of my practices, uh, comments I've gotten or feedback I've gotten back are good. So for example, um, I'll do in pre-calc calculus um, weekly quizzes. Okay. Like, not everyone does this. Uh, and professors that it's just all the tests. Right? Yeah. The tests are the main grades. And for me, the tests are still the main grades. But I do the weekly quizzes. I, I make the homework a grade because I try to keep them on it. The, yeah. the biggest problem, I think, is the students that push it off and try to cram right before the test. I don't think that works for math. Like Trying to cram right beforehand, even if it gets you through that test, you then forget it and further test. Because again, everything's building off one another. Further tests then go poorly, because you just crammed for that one, thinking you just need to get through that test. So, yeah. Well, you didn't really just need to get through that test. You need that information to take on subsequent tests, even after that one. Mm -hmm. So if I can get them to stay on it by, I got to study for a quiz every week, or I got to get this homework done by next class. Like I don't give them two weeks for homework. I say, you get this homework done by next class, and then we're going to move on. And, and I've actually gotten good feedback from that. Like I needed that sort of kick in the butt to stay yeah. on top of it so I'm not cramming and I'm actually picking up more stuff along the way. And not even, and not even just for the fact that, re, that um, students can stay on top of it. I believe that students appreciate there being more grades in the grade book, just so that if professors give you let's say four tests out of the semester, yeah. each one is going to, you have to do really well on each one. If you do poorly, it could be very detrimental. It, yes, it, it, it serves as a buffer too, that's true. Mm -hmm. that it's, it's not all or nothing for the tests. But again, the, the tests are, it's still kind of is. That, like, the quizzes are important, they, they kind of add up to another test, but they're supposed to be lower stakes. They're supposed to be, yeah, yeah it's still a grade and, and they appreciate that there's grades. I go back and forth with this because th there is a bit of a, uh, I think, too much of an emphasis on the grade itself from the student's aspect. It mm -hmm. is, it turns into like the only motivating factor for them. 
is just getting the grade rather than actually understanding yep. the material. And I try to say, well, okay, this is for understanding. This isn't like you fail a quiz. You're not failing the course. It's not going to tank you. It's a lower stakes thing. But it is supposed to be an indication of how you're going to be doing on the test. And that's really going to be determining your grade. <clears throat> so next up I have is, we were talking about this before, how do you measure success? Yeah, and my question was uh, <laughs> success in what? Like professional success, personal success? I mean, yeah, if, if, if I just get asked that question, how do you measure success? I'm probably to say, like, do I feel successful in life? That sounds like a very general question. Mm -hmm. And so having a successful career maybe is, can be part of it, but I would probably look at that and just uh, more of are, are you providing for family or loved ones or, or whatever sort of life that you have? Or are you taking care of your responsibilities? And having a good attitude and being in a good place while doing, you know, being generally happy with it. Maybe not being the richest person or, or the most successful professionally person. But mm -hmm. if you're going through life feeling that you've got people you can count on and you're taking care of it, like, I'm feeling, I'm feeling successful right now. I'm not, I don't have a million dollars or anything. But I feel good in, in what I do for work. I got a 10-month-old, my first, my first kid, a daughter, my wife and daughter at home that... You know, I'm, I'm helping provide for, and then always go back to them. I feel successful for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, professional success, I don't know. You know I'm, I'm working my way through CCM here four years in, trying to get a tenure and, and really establish myself here. Maybe I'll feel more successful there, but to, is that a measure of success? Uh, maybe. Uh, probably not. I, maybe I, I don't emphasize as much the professional side of it. It's just mm -hmm. my life view of it. So, you, would, so would you work in the definition success into both real life and into the teaching world? I guess I'm talking real life. Like if, if yeah. I want to talk success teaching, I guess that's a different question. Right? Mm -hmm. I'd go a different route with that. Um, successful teaching is is the performance of your students, I suppose. Are you, are you getting success from your students? Mm -hmm. um, but also that they're not hating what you're doing, like that you're not presenting in a way that they just hate you and hate the subject, that it's, it's a terrible experience. You should have happy students, but challenge them still and, and get them involved. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you're getting the students involved, even if they don't, at the end of the day, completely understand it, you're getting them trying and involved, I think that's successful teaching, trying to get them just interested and, and maybe continuing to ask themselves these questions or asking questions after the fact. That's successful teaching for me, I think. OK. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah. And now, we'll take a break. Please stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Choosing a college is a big, big, big deal. But I know I started right, because CCM is in the top 2% of community colleges in the nation. And at County College of Morris, I get to choose over 100 programs. Whether you're just out of high school, like me, exploring career options, like me, or seeking lifelong learning, like me, make CCM your choice, like me. Go big and visit ccm.edu and aspire to be you. And we're back on CCM All Access. I'm Mitchell Etta, and we're here with Professor Joshua Fry. Welcome back, Joshua. <clears throat> so we'll start off with, how do you support students who may have lower math comprehension? I think the most important part is just staying patient with them, like if I'm working with them one-on-one -on -one anyway. Uh, if, if it's taking them a longer time just to process stuff, or, or they're not understanding step-by-step, step, I, I just try to be as patient as possible even if I'm repeating questions, they're, they're, they're losing track of things as you go through. It's, it's sometimes you just got to do it over and over until it sticks with them. Um, right, uh, uh, the page, yeah, I say the page, that's, that's the biggest problem I'll see with people that can't handle the lower comprehension or that, that are frustrated with them is that they just get too impatient with them. Mm -hmm. And then the student gets impatient or they get uh, out of whack and they don't want to be part of that situation either. And so they're not, they're very much distracted or that's not going to help them learn the stuff either. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Uh, I also try just in, I try to design lessons even, or how I present material so that uh, thinking of the, the wide range of, of capabilities or comprehension levels that I have in there. So I'll do things like um, I, I post guided notes beforehand. I have all my definitions and theorems and stuff like all written out that you can print them out so you're not spending time in class just copying things down and not listening to me. I want you more listening to me and I want you engaging with me. Mm -hmm. So, and that's for the lower students. So if I don't want the lower students sitting there really like, oh, I need to copy this all down. 
and not listen to me because then they're not going to get the main idea. Um, I want them to already have that, and I leave the examples blank because that I'm going to work out, and that's going to be the back and forth I have with the students and try to engage them. And sometimes I'm the professor that I'll call students out sometimes. Like if I'm getting the same participation from like the same students over and mm -hmm. over, I'm like, all right, I've heard from you guys enough. Like you, you, you tell me this, and I'll put the softball ones. Like I just got to see like are you at least a little bit on the same page, like you fall on at least like a very basic sort of thing, mm -hmm. like I'll pick those people out and make sure that everyone's, or try to make sure everyone's sticking with me. Now how effective is tutoring in office hours, uh, and, and let's say specifically for, for math? For yeah, math. I, that's, that's a good place to go. Um, I wish people did it more. I, I, I have students that figure out office hours are good, and then I'll get mm -hmm. regulars that they just keep coming out because they figure out oh, I could just go with the professor and work on my homework and ask questions and then have them explain. And then, yeah, you understand it better. It's, you get the one-on-one -on -one time, yeah, it's, that's huge, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's going to help the understanding big time. Do you, do you feel you get enough students coming into office No, there hours? should be more. I, I get a good amount, but there, there should be. There's, and it's, sometimes it's the students that don't necessarily need to be coming to office hours. Like, there's students that should be coming mm -hmm. and ones that I'm glad they're coming because they want to make sure they're getting it. But at the same time, like, why are you, why are you here? Like, you, you get this fine. Like, you don't need to. But not, not that I say that to them. Just, yeah. I kind of have that thought. But no, I, I, I want everyone to come to office hours and, and utilize the tutoring center, too. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one-on-one -on -one help. That, that can be huge, absolutely. <clears throat> and next I have, where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Here, I hope. Like, uh, I'm, I'm trying. I'm in the what's called the tenure track. Um, four years in, if you start your sixth year, this is New Jersey law. If you start your sixth year at an institution, uh, you get tenure, uh, which is it's job security in a sense. It's it's makes it much more difficult for them to fire you. Get rid of you. You have to do something very egregious mm -hmm. uh, to to not be able. It's it's a it's supposed to give you some academic freedom is the idea behind it that you have more. You're not as worried about your job that you can try other things in the classroom. You can you can try to innovate more or, or do different things to have the most success in your class or you know figure things out. And if it doesn't work out so well, sometimes you can readjust or change. But again, not not have like the job security looming over your head as as you do it. It, it provides some academic freedom. Mm -hmm. um, but five to ten years, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I'm still teaching here. I really like the math faculty here. Like. Uh, that's that's so key. Ed, anywhere you work, it, you gotta like the people you're working with. Yeah. And I really like the math faculty here. So, I want to stick it out here. We'll see what happens if 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 I'm not here, maybe teaching somewhere else. But I'm not even opposed to to pivoting and changing to a different career. I probably just have to figure out what I could use my math logic skills to go do out in the world. Yeah. Um, other than just teach math. So let's dive into math itself before the interview. You, we were talking about how you enjoy learning and teaching discrete math. Um, so talk about talk about it. Talk about discrete math. Oh uh, sure. Uh, so you probably need to introduce what it is. Most people, you go on the street and you say, "What's discrete math?" and say, "I don't know. I probably can't hear about it." But it's not that kind of discrete. It's not like it's spelled differently. It's not like mm -hmm. discrete. Keep it a secret. It's discrete in that you can count things out. It's discrete as opposed to continuous. Calculus, algebra, things like this, these are continuous maths. Think of it as you, you consider all the numbers from 0 to 1, like every fraction, every decimal, all the irrationals, rationals. You work over a continuous line. Mm -hmm. Discrete math doesn't do that. Discrete math is you can describe a problem, and you can like enumerate all the scenarios or all the situations and, and potentially work through all of them. There might be a jillion possibilities, but you could theoretically maybe work through all of them that there's many but a finite number. Mm -hmm. So uh, a very, uh, an exemplary problem of, of discrete math is something called the traveling salesman problem. Uh, so you imagine there's a salesman, and salesman has a list of, we'll say, five cities that they need to travel to and, and do their sales bit. So they got to go to each city once, and then end up back where they started, end up back home. But this is not in a necessary order, right? You can go between any city and any city, but flights cost different, travel costs are different, based on which city you go to. So what is the cheapest way to hit each city and get back where you start? It's a very applicable, very uh, interesting, or, or people are interested in solving this kind of question, right? You want to mm -hmm. optimize stuff, you want to. Now I can go through every possibility and, and say, well, I go A, B, C, D, E, or A, C, D, you know, whatever. But you get too many cities, even 10 cities, there's already an insane number like in the millions of, of possibilities. So 
can you come up with something more creative to figure out the best route rather than just going through everything brute force? Mm -hmm. And there's problems where sometimes, yeah, brute force is good enough, but the traveling salesman problem is one where because there's so many options so quickly, even like super computer, you put all the computers on a, on a problem for trillions of years, it's not enough time for them to go through every possibility. Um, so that's, that's what I find interesting. It's, it's problems that you can very easily state and understand what the problem is, but the solutions are deep and difficult, and, and you got to get creative there. So is that how it differs from like your general math courses like college algebra or uh, calculus? Yeah, it, I'd say college algebra pre-calc is all building to calculus, and calculus is a tool. There's, there's no calculus research. There's no open problems in calculus. Right? Mm -hmm. It's used to solve problems that we have all the time. Um, discrete math, there are all kinds of open problems, and it, it has other applications. A uh, big application to discrete math is something called graph theory, which again, I have to distinguish from calculus and continuous math. It's not y equals x squared types of graphs. It's, it's, it's networks. It's vertices connected with edges. These are the mm -hmm. terms you use to talk about a graph. A graph is just basically dots connected with lines. And how you draw them doesn't matter. It just is how are things connected up. Uh, so these have applications for social networks or, or social networking. Um, I remember reading about the military using graph theory and looking at uh, like terrorist organizations, like uh, uh, social networks of, of the terrorist organization, they, like who knows who and who they spend time with. And, and this like analyzing the graph actually helped them sort of figure out where people were or, or who they should be focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, but also the, the internet, search engines, it's all graph theory. The internet is a giant graph because every website is one of these vertices, is a vertex. And if a site gets linked to another site, well, that's your edge connecting the two sites. Mm -hmm. So a search engine wants to look at all the sites, and you have to be able to navigate through all the sites and find what you're looking for. What is the most effective algorithm for doing this yep. uh, and finding what you want to find? It's, it's all graph theory. So that's why your computer science students here, I, I, I teach a, an evening graph theory in the fall. And it's basically always computer science students. Computer science has to take discrete math. That's our main clientele other than just math majors can take it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why it's, it's used in, in computing. Like computer uh, science itself is, is a lot like a discrete math. It's just sort of a discrete math in its own right. And you mentioned the word algorithm. And yeah. a lot of people nowadays, I know what's going around, is people talking about like the TikTok algorithm right. or the YouTube right. algorithm. And that's, that's very real. Like there's, there's a whole process, sure. a whole algorithm behind, behind all that, right? But, but you're right. Today, it's, it's uh, algorithm is turned into this like mystical word. Like there's, every company has their magic algorithm that they guard, and, and no, no one knows how it works. I, I mean, they're, they're putting too much stock. It's just the, the times, I guess, too much stock has got put into this word. Because they're all using them, sure. But an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step how to work through something, how to make decisions as you go through something. Mm -hmm. uh, you do all kinds of basic algorithms. An algorithm is a very general term. So yeah, these websites have their algorithms. But any, any business has its own algorithm for how they, how they process through whatever they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I think we should take a little bit of the mysticism away from the word. But yeah, they, they do have algorithms. But that's, they, they are now referring to something a little bit bigger than just what the word algorithm means, I think, Okay. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so lastly, I have, can you share an example of an effective classroom management technique? Classroom, yeah, uh, this, this is an interesting question to ask college professor, I think, because classroom management in college is way different than high school or anything before, because that's, that's a different scenario. You're, you're dealing with minors. You, there's a certain control you need to sort of have, and they're not developed as much mm -hmm. in terms of maturity. Um, we're dealing with adults. I mean, there there's still seem like kids, you know, some, you know, they're 18, 19, right out of high school. You're still, you're still a kid. But this is a community college. In any college, I have students that are older than me. Um, that's just a part of it. So uh, it's, it's not the same kind of dynamic. And so in terms of managing things, I, what I've found that works for me is, is just being as straight with people as I can. I, I just mm -hmm. try not to put on airs of just, this is what we got to do. Uh, I, I need you. If, if, I guess you also don't have as many problems. Like if, if, if you're talking about management in terms of students acting out or, or doing things, there are these stories. We, faculty have to deal with it. But I deal with it on, on a much less, if, if really any kind of basis, than mm -hmm. when I've done uh, things with, with younger students. Uh, I, I've done a, I don't do this anymore because I have a kid, I don't have time to do it. But over the summers, for like eight, nine years in a row, I worked at a, a summer program that John Hopkins runs 
for like middle school through high school age, but working with a lot of middle school age students, uh, very gifted students, that's the idea of the program, is, is I come in and I'm doing like college level math and I'm doing some of the stuff I do in discrete mm -hmm. with these students because I can understand it, but they don't have the maturity. So, so I have to do very different kind of classroom management in that setting than I do in college. I don't have to deal with the same kind of stuff that I do in, in college. So I haven't, maybe I don't have as, as many techniques just because I haven't had to develop as many. Like I said, I, I just try to be straight with them, honest with them. If they're giving me guff or they're, they're coming back at me, it's like, I'm just going to tell you the way it's going to be. You might be getting mad at me, but you know, the situation is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't had any big problems yet, or, or I don't know if I have real big techniques, but that's maybe what I'd say about that. All right. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah. Thank you for your input. Okay, thank you. This concludes another edition of CCM All Access. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.